Good. So, as I promised you last time, the first thing that we will do today is to show this estimate, this BV estimate on slices of normal currents. So remember from last time, so here we are actually dealing with the zero dimensional slices. So we have T, which is a normal current of dimension N on some metric space ED. Then we have pi from E to Rn, which is a Lipschitz map. Then the slicing is telling you there is a family of normal one, uh, zero dimensional currents. which is depending upon this projection map pi and the point x, which is, taking, which is taken in the set of values of pi. And for the ease of notation, so let, we're actually calling this T sub x. And this family of currents has the following property. So if I want to compute T of phi, C composed pi, d pi, where phi is a test function, Lipschitz and Baudin on E. Okay, this is actually equal to the restriction of T on the form psi composed pi, d pi, and this is now a zero dimensional current which is computed on phi, which is a function. Then I have a kind of Fubini type formula which tells me that this is equal to integrating over the space of possible values of pi. And then here I'm integrating the value of the current Tx when I evaluate on phi. And then I have psi of x dx. Okay? So this, 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 this slicing theorem is nothing but giving you a type of Fubini type formula for currents. Okay? So now we want to use this identity. Let us call it slice identity. We want to use this identity, and of course we want to plug in suitable test function phi and psi to understand how this function is varying. See, so the, the idea would be, let us consider this as a function of x. And let us see what I can put here as psi and try to estimate something about the function f of x. So for instance, if you want to, in, if you want to estimate the distributional derivative of f, it seems nice to take psi to be the divergence of something. Okay? So. Of course, this identity is true. We said for every phi in, in Lipschitz uh, bounded E, and it's also true for every psi which uh, belongs to Lipschitz and bounded on Rn. Okay? So, So the goal is therefore to estimate the following quantity. Right, well now phi is just a vector field which is going from Rn into Rn. And we can even assume phi is C infinity. But in fact, phi in C1 is more than enough to carry on this computation. Uh, phi in C1 and bounded, maybe let us say phi is C1 and compactly supported. Okay? So, then we know from the formula that this is simply equal to T of phi divergence phi composed pi d pi, right? And it actually looks that this divergence phi composed pi d pi 
I can write it as the differential of some form. Okay, so in fact, observe if I call phi i the components of phi. <coughs> It's not too difficult to see that this is just the following thing. Okay, what does it mean actually to have this, this thing over here? So say if i is for instance equal to two, I'm just taking d pi one wedge, I'm skipping d pi two, and then I take d pi three, d pi n. So this is what I mean by this funny notation. Indeed, you observe immediately when I take the d of this, right? I'm taking actually d phi i dxj composed pi, d pi j. But if I have d pi j and j is different from i, since I have the same d pi j here in this alternating form, right? The wedge becomes zero. So the only wedge that survives from here is the d phi i dxi composed pi, d pi i, right? And then if I want to put it in here to get d pi, I have to swap i minus one times, okay? So, having observed this, we can now insert this identity in there, and we actually get the following thing, so tx phi. Divergence of phi of x, the x, this is equal, and here I will have the sum over i because I'm using the linearity of the, um, of the current. And then I will have t evaluated, well, minus 1 to the i minus 1, and then I will have t evaluated on this form. So let us give a name to this thing over here. Let us call it d phi, uh, uh, well, okay. Let us call it d star pi i. Okay, now, of course, you observe that you have also the chain rule. So this thing over here is nothing but d of phi little phi i composed pi d star pi i, right, minus d phi wedge phi i composed pi d star pi i. Okay, so now I'm plugging in this other identity inside, and this is what I get. Okay, and now what you observe over here is, uh, but this is the t of the d of a form, so this is actually the boundary of the, of, of the current t evaluated on this form. So let me do this. <clears throat> okay, so now, A 
assume I want to bound the integral here on the left-hand side. So assume I want to bound actually the modulus of this integral. And now I use the fact that both the boundary of t has finite mass and t has finite mass. I can actually bound in the following way. I can actually say this is less or equal. And then you're, you're, you, you will notice what is this less or equal then. So I will have some constant over here. And then I will, I will get for the first term the Lipschitz constant of pi to the power n minus 1. Then the supremum of phi, so let us say it is the C0 norm of phi. And then by using the fact that the boundary of T has finite mass, I can actually integrate this function. against the mass measure of the boundary of P. And of course, I can do the same for the other part. Okay, so now let's be crude and put everything together. So you, you recognize the following thing. So this integral is bounded by some constant. Here, let me put that the constant is depending on the Lipschitz constant of pi. Then I will have the C1 norm of phi. And then I will have the integral of phi of x. And then here, the measure on which I'm integrating is actually the push forward through pi of the sum of the two measures, total mass of t plus mass of boundary of t. OK? So let us say that this, that this measure over here is some measure mu. So let us say that this function, I mean, let's call this function f of x. So this identity over here tells you the distributional derivative of tx phi, OK, is bounded by the integral of the modulus of phi of x against this measure. So this tells you that the distributional derivative of f It is a measure. That is, f is a, is a function of bounded variation. At least locally on Rn. But it doesn't tell you only that. It also tells you that when I actually want to take this distributional derivative and compute its modulus, its modulus is controlled uniformly by a single measure mu times a constant times the C1 norm of phi. OK? <clears throat> so 
So you see two interesting things. First of all, the fact that you have a function of bounded variation. When you are testing this Tx with the test function phi, and the second thing that you, that you have is that when you are varying this phi, of course, when you are varying this phi, if you take a phi which is very large, here you get a constant which is very large, which means that you get a derivative here which is very large. But on the other hand, the thing is under control, meaning that once you understand what this constant is, the measure here is fixed and is independent of the constant phi. Okay, so this is what Ambrosio, before actually dealing with, B, uh, with, with, with currency metric space, proposed as a general definition for BV functions on a Banach space. And actually, nowadays, this subject is fairly wide. So there is a whole literature about Sobolev and BV functions taking values in metric spaces which has taken up the works of uh, Ambrosio, Reshetniak, and other people. So this would be in the definition of Ambrosio. So first of all, what you do is you take, say, I0 over N, which are the possible slices of an integer rectifiable current. And you put a metric on this I0 over N by defining the following norm, which is called the flat norm. So the flat norm on S is the supremum for on, on uh, Lipschitz functions with C0 norm plus Lipschitz constant of phi less or equal than 1 of S acting on phi. See, this is essentially the norm which appears over here. And this is called the flat norm. And a BV map the BV log map G from Rn into this metric space is a map such that, first of all, any time that you compute on x, gx of phi, you get a BV function. And see, this is now a BV function. So this, this thing is a real number. So it's a BV function from Rn into R. And moreover, when you take the distributional derivative of this function, and you take its modulus, you can actually uniformly bound it by a constant C. Then the C0 norm of phi plus the Lipschitz constant of phi and then here you have a measure mu which is independent of phi. Okay, and what we just proved is the following estimate if is the following proposition. So if T is an integral current, so it's normal and integer rectifiable, and pi of dimension n and pi from E into Rn a Lipschitz map, 
then x goes into the slice of t through pi at the point x is a BV map taking values in the space of integral rectifiable currents of dimension 0 endowed with the flat norm. Okay? Actually, the thing that I've done for integral rectifiable currents, there's no need of doing it. You can do it also for normal zero-dimensional currents. Huh? So here you could have put actually normal currents and you would have the same. And actually the proposition that we have proved is that if, in, if you are just normal without knowing that you are actually integral rectifiable, then the slice map is taking values in the space of normal currents of dimension zero. Huh? So corresponding proposition for normal currents is actually what we literally proved uh, because we have not used the assumption of integrality at any point. So one interesting fact is that, and this you can for instance prove by hands on I0 over N is that actually this space endowed with this norm, which is going to give you a distance, right? So this is actually not a Banach space, sorry, because I can take only uh, an integer combination. So if it were the space of normal currents, it would be a Banach space. Otherwise, this is a subset. It's nonetheless a metric space. So this metric space gives you actually a complete metric space, okay? So you have a BV map into a complete metric space. Of course, the fact that it's complete is, is, is fairly useful. Okay, so that completes the, the, the program that we had on, on, on understanding integral rectifiable currents. So now let us get to regularity. So the cornerstone of first maybe the starting point of the whole regularity theory back in the 60s is actually a theorem of the Georgi for the co-dimension one case, which then was extended to all the case of all co-dimensions by Federer and Algren. And it's a typical epsilon regularity theorem. So the an epsilon regularity theorem is a statement of, 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 of the type if some suitable quantity is sufficiently small, So if some suitable quantity, which is usually an integral quantity, is small, then your object is regular. And then, of course, once you have a theorem of this type, the first thing that you might ask yourself is that under which assumptions this suitable integral quantity is small? Well, when you have an integral at a certain scale, the integral is surely small for most of the points just out of simple measure theoretic arguments. So usually this transforms a simple property in, in, in measure theory. For instance, the integral of an L1 function cannot be large at every scale, right, into a regularity theorem. Oh, okay, so when this is not too large, then at a certain scale, I will see something regular. And so this immediately gives you some partial regularity theorem, which is saying, so the bad points, the points where you might be possibly irregular are the points where some integral is sufficiently large, and maybe I can estimate the size of these particular points out of measure theoretic arguments. Okay, so the... De Georgi, which I would call also nowadays Allard Epsilon Regularity Theorem, works, we will state it for uh, integral rectifiable currents, but it actually works for more general objects which are called rectifiable verifolds, integral rectifiable verifolds. And we have to first understand what is the main 
parameter for which we are going to ask that if this is sufficiently small. So what is, so on which parameter are we going to compute the epsilon? Okay, so this is of course for an area minimize, for an integral rectifiable area minimizing current. I forgot that. I want to write this, but area minimizing. And of course, this is not going to be true in any metric space, but in Rn. So in the Euclidean space. Okay? So the quantity which is small, so the main parameter of regularity, which I will write for you as if the current were a smooth surface. So if the current were a smooth surface, the main parameter of regularity is the excess in a ball BRP. And this excess would be the integral over the surface of the distance of the tangent plane to the surface to a given plane and then I would minimize overall possible planes. Okay, so let us draw a picture over here. So for instance, if I am a smooth surface, a good choice here to show that this one is small is to take the tangent plane at the original surface. And then, of course, nearby, for points nearby, the planes are not tilting too much, right? And this quantity will be small. Sorry, this is the square. Now, it plays some role how I measure the distance between two different planes. Well, the distance between two different planes is, me is measured in the following way. So say that E1, En is an orthonormal basis for your plane Tx sigma. And F1, Fn, an orthonormal basis for tau. And it's important to and it's important to understand that they actually do come with orientation. So if I change a sign of one of these vectors, then I, I don't get the same tangent plane, but I get the tangent plane with the opposite orientation. Okay? So then Tx sigma minus tau zero squared, this is equal to two minus two times, and here you take the determinant of the following matrix. You take the scalar product of, of Fi with Ej. Okay? So this looks slightly funny. Actually, the way to understand this is the following. So if you represent this Tx sigma as the wedge product of E1, En, right? Then you're just looking at an element of the exterior algebra of Rn and on the exterior algebra, you can extend the usual scalar products that you have on Rn, and the usual scalar product gives you a Hilbert space structure. Okay? So, maybe I should put a remark over here. So, this is coming from an Hilbert space structure that you can put. on the space of k vector of n vector of Rn. Okay? So now, ideally, what you would like to say is that the Allard's regularity theorem, so this would be a false statement. Let me put it in here. So, false de Georgi 
Ah, l'arc. Um, and maybe let me also renormalize. Okay. Let me also renormalize with, 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 this, with this thing over here. Ah, I should actually tell you what. I should actually tell you what is the excess for a general integral rectifiable current first. So remember that an integral rectifiable current chops into Lipschitz pieces eh, in our Ambrosio Kirchheim theorem. But remember also that we said this is equivalent for the, to the Federer and Fleming theorem. So in the Federer and Fleming theory, you have uh, uh, integral rectifiable currents, which are union of pieces of C1 submanifolds. So although we cannot define what is the tangent space to the integral rectifiable current at every point, what you can take as definition of the tangent space is simply the tangent to the C1 submanifolds which were defining your integral rectifiable current. Of course, this might not give you a unique definition of tangent space because you have different ways of writing your current as pieces of C1 submanifolds, but it gives you, at least for almost every point, a unique tangent space. Okay? Or if you want, the other definition that we had was that the integral rectifiable current T is representable as the sum of push forwards through Lipschitz maps. of currents which are defined through integration. Roughly speaking, you would actually like to say that the tangent points at a certain point x is just going to be the push forward of the tangent space to Rn through this map. And now here, I just write this equality with some, with some quotation marks because this is not really, really true. You have to work out something more. So, um, so if P is given by, say, some psi i of x, then here you would just take the derivative of psi i, then compute it on Rn, Right, and this is going to be an n dimensional plane in Rn, at least when the rank of this derivative is n. Okay, so. Provided actually you have this definition, in here you will have a, a good definition of tangent to your current at almost every point with respect to the mass. And so you will be able to write something similar. So when you write something similar though, remember that your integral rectifiable currents come with multiplicity, come with integral multiplicity. So what happens for instance if you have a current which is two times a smooth manifold, simply you will see this two coming out here, right? So you would see also the multiplicity function in there, in the definition of excess. So if you want, for my general integral rectifiable current, the correct way of writing the excess So the excess at of, of the integral rectifiable current, say S, at a point P with re on, on the ball of reduce R, it's just going to be 1 over R to the power M. And here I will have the integral over the ball of reduce R centered at P. Here I have my uh, 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 mass T on X. And here I have the tangent to t at the point x minus 
tau zero squared, and here I have to take the minimum over, pos over all possible tau zero uh, 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 n-dimensional planes. This is S. Okay, so which essentially is equal to 1 over Rm. Here you will have the sum. Here you will have the decomposition of your current into pieces. So these would be smooth pieces of smooth manifolds. Here you would have the multiplicity. Let's call them lambda i. And here you would have the tangent to your smooth manifolds minus tau 0 squared. And then here you would have the usual volume. Right, so the idea is you chop into the n-dimensional pieces. Of course, you chop them in such a way that they are not overlapping on, on set of positive measures. And then actually here you will have the moduli of the densities. Okay? So modulo this technical definition, what you would like to say is something like if... The excess. Sorry. Right, right. But you're integrating. You're integrating. No, you're integrating. You are integrating over x. Okay. Ah. This is a constant, and this is integrating over x. Okay. So of course, if you take, I mean, if you're smooth, and you take the tangent place at the origin then the planes nearby are not too different. And then that quantity is small, right? But of course, for instance, if you are at an angular point, right? So at an angular point, whatever plane you take, that thing is going to be fairly large. And, and the cyclonite, uh, lambda i, not lambda, lambda i squared? No, it's not lambda i squared. Because you see, the lambda i is not connected to the tangent plane. It's connected to the volume, right? So. The mass is modulus of lambda i times the volume on the manifold. Okay, so this doesn't get squared, therefore. Okay, so very good. The false, unfortunately false, the Georgi Allard would be something like this. Would be that exists and epsilon zero, such that, positive, such that if the excess of an area minimizing current at a point P is less than epsilon zero, then S uh, then T is actually a single C1 alpha submanifold a single C1 alpha submanifold in the ball of radius R, R half. So once that integral gets smaller than a certain quantity in the ball of radius half, you actually are a C1 alpha submanifold. And then once you are a C1 alpha submanifold, you can actually write down a PDE for your, uh, 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 for your uh, uh, function, which is representing your submanifold as a graph, for instance, uh, uh, because you are area minimizing from the usual calculus of variations, from usual elliptic regularity, you would conclude that actually your submanifold is analytic, right? Because it solves an elliptic equation. Now, this is false. This is literally false. It's actually not true. We will show that there is a counterexample. So it's essentially true in co-dimension one. And then in co-dimension one, you just ask yourself, when is this quantity, right? When is the limit of this quantity for r going to zero equal to zero? On those points, you always know that there is maybe a sufficiently small ball around which you will be regular. Okay, so and the regularity theory therefore focuses on understanding when 
this is vanishing for r going to 0 for which points p. And OK, so you have to carry an important analysis, which is called classification of tangent cones. And uh, so there's a famous paper by Simons, which is telling you that these tangent cones have to be planes on most of the, of the places. And you actually conclude that this quantity is, in fact, mostly small, except for a set of very small dimension. OK? So and those is, that is going to be the singular set. Unfortunately, as I told you, in co-dimension, in, in higher co-dimension, this is false. And you need an extra hypothesis, which we'll see later, at the end of the next hour, what it is. OK? So I, I cannot, of course, prove you the Allard's regularity theorem. We don't even have all the definitions, the languages, because I'm giving you a crash course on, 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 on currents. But I'm going to give you a, 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 oh, the Georgie Allard. I'm going to give you a baby version. OK, so let me tell you the baby version. OK, so the baby version is going to be the following. And the baby version has, in, in some sense, the way I see the Allard regularity theorem, there's actually a part which is technical quotation marks. This technical part is actually what fails in higher co-dimension. So it's, after all, not so technical, at least from my point of view. So the, this technical part is not present in this theorem. Then I will tell you where the technical part comes from and uh, what are the difficulties in higher co-dimension. And then there is the PDE part. So, and the version I'm going to show you contains all the PDE's ideas of the regularity theorem, OK? OK, so the baby version is going to be the following. So assume your area minimizing current is a single Lipschitz graph. So it's a very strong assumption, right? So I'm already telling you it's the graph of a function and it's Lipschitz. And instead of assuming that the excess is small, let's assume that the Lipschitz constant is sufficiently small. OK, then I will actually show you that this function is C1 alpha. And you will see, if you have enough experience with certain techniques in PDEs, that it comes with an estimate. I mean, not only, I mean, it's C1 alpha in, in the ball of radius BR. Of course, all of this, if the Lipschitz constant is small in some ball of radius r. So if you have enough experience with PDEs, you will also see that the way we prove the theorem will give you an estimate. So we'll also tell you the C1 alpha norm is controlled by something else, and the something else actually will be the excess. So although we are actually assuming that the Lipschitz constant is small, which is kind of technical, the C1 alpha norm of the function will be estimated in terms of the excess not in terms of the Lipschitz constant, which will tell you why you can hope in Allard's regularity theorem to sort of remove this technical assumption. Of course, it's a technical assumption, but <laughs> I mean, knowing that something is a, Lipschitz, uh, is a Lipschitz graph already tells you you can make computations on them. Knowing that it's a bloody integrative fiber current doesn't tell you anything, essentially, at the beginning. Right? It's very, I mean, it's scattered pieces of, C1 fun of, of Lipschitz functions instead of being a single graph, OK? So what we will really do is the following. So the core of, of, of this version, so core of the proof, is to show the following. So we are under the assumption that the Lipschitz graph has a sufficiently small constant. So under that assumption, we will show that 
the excess at every point Q decays, so it's less or equal than some constant, times R to the power 2 alpha. And you will see that this constant, I mean, you will see that this constant essentially depends on the excess at the largest scale that you have. So this constant will depend essentially on the excess at the point Q. And R, we will take simply the distance between Q and the boundary of the ball R centered at P, roughly. Which, of course, will be uniformly under control for us. So the, it will be the core of the proof, and we will dedicate all our time, essentially, to derive this decay estimate. OK, so this is what is called excess decay. So why actually this excess decay gives you the desired regularity? So the reason is the following. Uh, make the following exercise. So on a Lipschitz function, on a Lipschitz graph, the excess on the ball on, on the point Q and ball of radius R, of radius R. So we are somewhere something like this. So you have your Lipschitz graph over here. Here you take a ball of radius R. And now you intersect the surface. And you're looking at the L2 oscillations of the planes on this surface. So actually, this is comparable to the integral over the projection of the graph down on the base. So let us call this plane, say, uh, um, let us call this plane Rm, and let us call this other Rk. And then our ambient space is Rm plus k. And what we are assuming is that our current is the graph of a function f. Right, so our excess is essentially going to be like the projection down of the graph of f intersecting with the ball of radius r centered at q. And here I will be integrating the derivative of the function f at the point x. And here I will be subtracting some linear function. See, I mean, if I have a graph of a function, right? So the plane will be, I mean, the tangent plane will be the image through the differential of the function f, right? Of my, of, 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 of my uh, um, uh, basis plane over here. And any reasonable tau zero, which does not have, I mean, of course, if tau zero is vertical with respect to my reference plane, then it will not be representable uh, uh, as the graph of an affine function. But of course, if I take a vertical plane, that integral is going to be very large. So when I want to minimize, I will minimize with planes which are essentially under control with the angle with the base plane. And it will be representable by some affine function A. Okay? And now you see that I'm just, I mean, I'm just measuring in what I was integrating in the excess, the distance between the tangent plane and my tau zero. And if both planes are not too tilted with respect to the horizontal plane, this is essentially equal to the uh, uh, norm of the uh, uh, linear, I mean, of the difference, uh, of the norm of the squared of the difference of the linear functions which parameterize these planes over the, the uh, reference horizontal plane. 
Okay. Then of course, here I'm integrating on the x. So here you will have, in fact, when you're computing the excess, here you will have also the fact that you're changing variables, right? I mean, the fact that you're taking the volume on the manifold. But if you have a small Lipschitz constant, the volume on the manifold and the volume on the horizontal plane, they are essentially under control. So one controls the other, uh, modulo constant. So the tilde over here just means that the excess is bigger or equal than, you know, one half of this and it's less or equal than two times of this, right? So that they control each other with two constants. And in fact, this constants, this constants which, which control each other, it's going to one, if you make the computation carefully, it's really going to one with the choices that we have when the Lipschitz constant is going to zero, okay? So now, if you are trying to minimize this, what would you actually put in here? I mean, if you're trying to minimize the L2 norm of G minus a constant, what are you putting as a constant? You put the average of the function, okay? This is very elementary thing. So this minimum actually is achieved over here by averaging over this region, okay? Now, the projection, this projection, of course, is not going to be exactly the, it's not going to be exactly the disk of radius R, right? Because here you're intersecting with the ball. So it will be slightly different, but it's essentially very close to be the ball of radius R, right? So let us give it a name. So this is going to be the ball of radius R. Is, I mean, there's going not to be such a big difference. So this is going to be the hat ball on, on, on hat P or on hat Q. So hat Q is sitting down here. And then this minimum is just the average of the derivative of F on the ball. Okay. So now you have a function for which, I mean, if you could prove the decay, the decay would imply you that the derivative of the function f as this decay on the integral. Average, right? Because I'm also dividing by r to the m. So if you want here, that was 1 over r to the m, which means that I can actually put just the average. So the excess decay is telling you this average of the L2 distance from df and its average on the ball of radius r is going down like a constant times r to the power 2 alpha. Now, if you have seen some elliptic regularity, this is what is called a Morey estimate. And the Morey estimate implies that your function is C0 alpha. So the, the Morey estimate implies that dg is C0 alpha. If you've never seen this, it's not that difficult either. You can try to make it as an exercise. So this is a known fact. And it's attributed to Morey and Campanato. And it says, if, say, g is an n1 function, say, on some domain in our n, and there exists a constant c, such that the average of g minus the average of g squared over any ball is controlled by some constant r to the 2 alpha, and say this is going to be true for any ball inside omega with the constant independent of r and the point x, then g is c0 alpha. So when you actually go through the proof of what we will call the excess decay, you will want to show that this excess decay has the constant c 
which is under control, which is independent of the point. We will not be able to achieve some, I mean, when you go through the proof carefully, you will notice that if the point x is getting, I mean, remember that the excess for us, or the Lipschitz, or the, the, the function is defined on the ball of reduce r. If the point x is going very close to the boundary of the domain where you are defined, you will see that this constant blows up. But if you stay far away from the boundary, you will see that this constant can be uniformly controlled. So that's why you will actually conclude the C0 alpha regularity on the ball of radius 1 half. Okay? So that is, the, that is the, uh, somehow the, 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 the first part of the proof, if you want, which we are not going to show. So the important point is therefore just to come to this excess decay and let me just state in some sense the main lemma which will give you the excess decay by iteration. And maybe this lemma would be what you would like to call excess decay. So if you want, this is going to be a proposition, although it's the main proposition. So this proposition is telling you if the Lipschitz constant is sufficiently small, okay, then For every, okay, and, uh, okay, so then the, 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 uh, the, uh, the excess would be sufficiently small. Then, maybe here I should put, so that exists an eta which is less than one, such that if the Lipschitz constant is sufficiently small, so less than an epsilon bar, then when I look at the excess at any point, on the radius r half, this is going to be less or equal than this eta times the excess on qr. Okay? So this is the true excess decay, and you see how you will actually conclude that the thing is decaying on all radii. So if you iterate this proposition, what you will have is that the excess on Q R divided by 2 to the K is less or equal than eta to the K E Q R. Right? And here you see what power alpha you're going to get. So of course here you would just see that if I take eta to be uh, 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 the log in basis 2 of, um, uh, I mean if I take the log on basis 2 of eta, so I can actually rewrite this as 2 to the uh, um, minus k, and here I can put minus log in basis 2 of eta, and so minus log in basis 2 of eta, that's going to be my alpha. Right, so if this, of course, is going to be rho, this is essentially going to be rho to the power alpha. Okay, so let's make five minutes break, and then in the second hour, I'm going to show you how this decay can be proved under the assumptions that we have. Let's go with, um, with this excess decay. So the proof is essentially divided in four parts. So in part A, first of all, recall that your excess
was equal to the minimum over all possible tau zero of one over r to the m. And here you would have the integral of the tangent to the surface minus tau zero squared. OK? So of course, if you're a Lipschitz graph, I mean, this tau zero will not be too far from the tangent to the graph of f. So this tau zero is also essentially controlled by the Lipschitz constant of f, OK? So you could as well assume that tau zero is actually the horizontal plane. I mean, you can always rotate your system of coordinates so that you actually have your tau zero the, the, the plane. And of course, now you will be, again, a Lipschitz map on a different coordinate system, but since the tilting of the plane is under control, maybe your Lipschitz constant just, just becomes twice as much, OK? So the first thing that you observe is that actually I can assume tau zero to be the horizontal plane. Very good. The other thing that you also observe is that I can always apply an homotopy, right, and put the ball of radius r to the ball of radius 1, right? I just apply an homotopy, which would be like x maps into x divided by r. If you were area minimizing, the homotetic surface is also area minimizing, right? So if you find a better competitor for the homotetized surface, then you scale it back, and this is a better, better competitor for the thing down. And you also observe that the excess has this 1 over r to the m. And this is like what happens when, I mean, this, this makes actually your excess scaling invariant under homotities. OK? So without loss of generality, we also assume r equal 1. Right? Very good. So once you've done that, Now, there's a computation which I'm not going to show you, but that, that you should do, and which tells you why we actually wanted to measure the distance between planes with that particular norm, right? I mean, of course, once I have expressed the decay, once I know that this integral is decaying like constant r to the 2 alpha, whatever norm you pick which measures the distance between planes and is equivalent to the other norm, that one is decaying as well. So you could ask me, why did you want to actually take that particular norm? And the reason why I took that particular norm is because when you are actually looking at the graph and you have a Lipschitz constant which is very, very small, that norm, when tau zero is horizontal, looks exactly like the Dirichlet energy of the F. So that's a Taylor expansion that you can do if you want of that quantity over there. And that's important because then we are going to argue on the Dirichlet energy. So, and this happens because we have chosen that particular norm, okay? If we choose another norm, that's not going to happen. So, this is a basic computational fact. So, if you want, this is also an exercise. By the way, we have defined norms. So. You will actually see that if you compute the Dirichlet energy, on this particular ball, and I'm going to tell you what this is. So this is less or equal than the excess on Q1 
and then here I will have one plus C. Okay, so let us actually call uh, 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 epsilon bar, and here let us put also epsilon bar, where epsilon bar is the Lipschitz constant of the function f. Okay? And you will have a similar inequality. Um, when you're looking at the excess on the point Q one half, you will actually be able to control this by one half. Then I will have the integral of df minus the average of df squared on the ball of radius one half. And then once again, over here, I will have to multiply by one plus a constant times epsilon bar, okay? So this comes from two observations essentially. So this comes from the observation that Yes, yes, this is just a geometric constant. Which is independent on anything. I mean, it only depends on the dimension. Say, for two dimension, you get a certain constant. For three dimension, you get a certain other constant. Okay? So let me tell you where it comes from. So, first of all, so on the, on the ball of radius one, right? So here you have your graph, right? And So here down you have the ball of radius 1. So what is this funny constant times the Lipschitz constant of f4? Well, that is because you see that there is a difference between the sphere and the cylinder, right? So the, the, the surface which is lying over the sphere is something, but I mean the, the surface which is lying in the sphere is not the surface which is lying over the cylinder. On the other hand, if the Lipschitz constant is under control, Right? On this cylinder, where now the new radius is going to be 1 minus constant times epsilon bar, all of the surface which is lying in this cylinder is also lying in the ball. Okay? If you take your point centered on the graph of the surface. Okay, and you will see that, so it depends essentially on this, you know, so what, what, is, what is actually the graph getting out possibly of the ball, right? Uh, I mean, if it's getting out exa such, it's exactly when the cylinder touches the, the sphere, then you're happy. Of course, this happens if and only if the function is exactly constant, right? And now you see that the Lipschitz constant is telling you that I'm possibly leaving at a certain height, but the height at which I'm leaving is controlled by one times the Lipschitz constant. Eh? And so if you want to be picky, actually here you could be more precise, actually, um, let's see. So here actually, yes, you have to take the square root of epsilon bar. Yes. Okay, so because, so this side over here, you're going to estimate as comparable to a constant, and here you see the Lipschitz constant, which is coming from the dimension, a square root of epsilon bar. Although maybe in this particular argument, the constant is not depending on epsilon bar, okay? So this thing over here, the four comes from the fact that the cylinder and the sphere are kind of comparable, but not exactly equal. Hmm? So in here, I'm not putting anything, and in here I'm not putting anything because the ball is inside the cylinder, right? So if I control an integral over the cylinder of radius one half, okay, the ball is just going to be exactly inside the cylinder. So the cylinder with size one half is slightly outside of the ball when you're looking at this slab where the surface is lying. Okay, so this tells you why here I'm not doing anything. Okay, then you have an integrand inside. And that is the reason why I'm going to have one plus constant epsilon bar. So essentially here, 
this df squared comes because if, I mean, remember the optimal plane uh, at, at, the, at the scale 1, I change coordinates in such a way that tau 0 is exactly equal to 0, okay? So the computation here tells you, and this is the computation that is going to, to give you this df squared and this 1 plus constant epsilon bar over there. So the true Taylor expansion that you have to do, which is a simple... Uh, uh, a calculus exercise, so the Taylor expansion tells you take the distance between the tangent to your graph f and the horizontal plane, let's say Rm, with the classical, I mean with the standard orientation. So this thing squared is actually df squared plus big O of df cubed. In fact, if you make the, 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 the Taylor expansion very carefully, you actually get df to the power 4. Okay? And of course, this one is the Lipschitz constant to the square times df squared. Okay? So actually here, you will be able to put, in fact, epsilon bar squared instead of square root of epsilon bar. But this does not play a big role for our proof. I mean, even a crude estimate is fine enough. But if you want to be picky, when you make the, the Taylor expansion, you can observe, actually, that this has a better estimate. This can be estimated by epsilon bar squared. And of course, it's going to be the same over here, apart from one fact. So here, the optimal plane, you will not know. The, opti the optimal plane is given by some linear affine plane. But then you observe that uh, this is not too far from the average, okay? Because the optimal plane is not too far from the average because of the observation that we had before. Good. So, therefore, see, somehow the estimate that you're trying to prove is that this quantity is less or equal than something less than 1 times this quantity. And if I actually achieve to prove that this integral controls this integral, times a constant which is strictly smaller than 1, then I have 1. Because for epsilon bar sufficiently small, right, the corresponding constant that I have in the inequality between this guy and that guy will be less than 1 as well. Okay? So the real goal is to show the following estimate under the assumption that the first optimal plane is uh, uh, lying uh, uh, horizontal. So the, the estimate I want is really this one. So that there exists an epsilon such that if the Lipschitz constant is smaller than this epsilon, then um, this thing on the ball of radius 1 half will be controlled by eta, and eta will be less than 1, and here I, I will have the ball of radius 1. So this is one I want to prove, and now I will tell you actually what the eta is. The eta can be achieved to be anything which is close to 1 over 4. So that's quite interesting. What I will prove is that for every sigma bigger than 0, there exists an epsilon such that if epsilon bar, which remember is the Lipschitz constant of f, is smaller than epsilon, then I will have this inequality with the sigma over here. And you see, I have 1 quarter. So when epsilon bar is sufficiently small, I will stay close to 1 quarter as well in the original excess on which I want the inequality. OK? So how am I going to prove this? And where is this magic 1 over 4 coming? So you will see in a second. So this is part b. So now I'm going to argue by contradiction and say, well, assume this is not true. Then there is a sequence of fk whose graphs are area minimizing, whose Lipschitz constant is going to 0, 
and such that they all violate this inequality. So if not, there exists a sigma bar bigger than 0, such that there exists a sequence fk of Lipschitz maps. Of course, at this point, I can always put the Lipschitz, I mean, I can always risk, I mean, translate the system of coordinates in such a way to put the Lipschitz graphs touching 0. So fk of 0, I will assume, is equal to 0. The Lipschitz constant of fk, which I'm going to call epsilon bar k, is going to 0. They are all, the graphs, are all area minimizing surfaces. And you will see that, in fact, area minimizing is not going to be really important. The important point is that they are stationary, so their first variation is equal to 0. And last but not least, they all violate this inequality. Okay, so now I've taken a sequence. Of course, what I would like in my contradiction argument is to take a limit of the sequence. But remember, the Lipschitz constant is going down to 0. So the function itself is not so meaningful. In the, in the limit, I just get 0, right? So of course, since I have an L2 norm over here, it's very tempting to rescale I mean, vertically the function, so to redivide by uh, uh, a, a constant in such a way that the energy the Riedrich energy is actually equal to 1, okay? So it's a very natural thing to do, and that's what we're going to do. So we introduce the GK, which are going to be equal to the FK, right? Redivided by, and I'm going to redivide by the square root of this integral. Uh, re sorry, remember that here there's the square root. Okay? So now, GK has a uniform bound in W12, right? So GK is converging to some G weakly in W12, so at least strongly in L2. And G is going to be a W12 function on the ball of radius 1, OK? So now I'm going to claim two important things, and these two things are going to be the key issues for the contradiction argument. So the first thing I claim is that this GK is converging to a G, and this final G is actually harmonic. The second claim is going to be that, in fact, GK, although it's converging to G in L2, it's actually converging strongly in W12 inside the ball. So actually, the Dirichlet energy of GK is converging to the Dirichlet energy of G as long as you don't take the ball of radius 1. On the ball of radius 1, it might fail, actually. But in balls compactly supported, you actually have strong convergence. So DGK converges to dg strongly in L2 on any ball
okay, of radius r strictly less than 1. Okay, assume that is true. If that is true, you can, well, first of all, you can divide. You see, if, if this inequality is true, this inequality is completely invariant under multiplication of fk by a function. So this inequality is going to be true for gk as well. And if this is true, you see this quantity over here is converging to the corresponding quantity for g, because you have strong convergence in the ball of minus 1 half. And here, although this is not converging strongly, well, it's converging weakly. And when you converge weakly, the limit is less or equal than the limit though, right, by weak convergence. So by this, you actually conclude that the integral on a ball of radius 1 half of dg minus the average of dg squared is bigger or equal than 1 over 4 plus the sigma bar, the integral of dg modulus squared on the ball of radius 1. OK? Now, this is an harmonic function. So the average of dg on the ball of radius 1 half is just dg computed at 0 by mean value property. Also observe this integral is bigger or equal than 1. So if this integral is bigger or equal than 1, this integral here is bigger or equal than 1 quarter, which means that when you pass into the limit, this integral is bigger or equal than 1 quarter also. Okay? So not only is bigger or equal than 1 quarter plus sigma bar times the integral of dg squared, but it's actually even bigger than this. So the true chain of inequality that we have is this one. So this tells you something important. Not only the harmonic function is having this inequality, but the harmonic function is not identically constant, right? Because this integral is not identically equal to 0. It's important because there's nothing wrong with the harmonic function equal to 0. And the harmonic function equal to 0 satisfies the second inequality. So satisfies this, b or equal than 1 quarter plus sigma bar times this. But we will show that if the harmonic function is non-trivial, which is satisfied by this, this is going to be false. So I will just show that for harmonic functions, the integral over here is less or equal than 1 quarter times that guy, reaching a contradiction. So that is going to be claim 3, contradiction. Because harmonic functions contradict C. OK, so now let me get to the proofs of claim 1, 2, and 3. So the first claim is the harmonicity. And in some sense, the important claim is just the harmonicity. So what I'm just telling you is that being a minimizer of the area functional, but having the Lipschitz constant going to 0, huh, is converging, I mean, means that your functions are converging to an harmonic function. And what is the upshot of that? I mean, why, why is that true? Essentially, it's because when you compute the area functional on a graph, and you make a Taylor expansion of the area functional, you will see that the integrand expands in 1 plus modulus of the f squared divided by 2 plus higher order. So the area functional is essentially the Dirichlet energy when the gradients are very small. So a minimizer is essentially very close to a minimizer of the Dirichlet energy. And the minimizer of the Dirichlet energy is an harmonic function. Okay? But actually, this is true at the level of critical points. So, Let's see this. So of course, what you know is that the graph of fk is a minimizer for the area functional, right? So take fk and perturb it by adding epsilon phi to it. 
where phi is a C infinity compactly supported function on the ball of radius 1, right? So this graph has the same boundary as the graph of FK, but the graph of FK is area minimizing. So this must be less or equal than the mass of the graph of F. Okay, now you have the usual calculus of variations trick. If this is going to be true for every epsilon, the only way this can be true is that it should have that dd epsilon of the mass of the graph of fk plus epsilon phi is actually equal to zero. Okay? Very good. Now, compute the mass of the graph of fk. Well, that's not such a simple exercise. Well, in co-dimension one is very easy. In higher co-dimension is slightly more tricky. So what is the mass of a graph of a function? OK, so this is the integral. And then here you have the square root. And here you have 1 plus, here you would have gradient of f plus epsilon phi squared. And this would be it in co-dimension 1 for functions which are just real valued. But then you have many more stuff in higher co-dimension. And in higher co-dimension, you have the sum of the determinants of the k times k minus of d of fk plus epsilon phi. OK? Now, you see, though, when I take dd epsilon of this, and compute it at epsilon equal to 0. So when I differentiate that quantity, observe that what you're going to get is the integral. Well, I will get 1 divided by all the junk. So 1 plus gradient of f squared plus sum over all the minors, blah, blah. And then I differentiate this guy. I get dfk, scalar product with d phi, OK? And then I get something also by the differentiating these other guys. And you will see that I get something like big O of df cubed d phi, right? Now, of course, I can also tailor expand this guy. So this is 1 plus half modulus of fk squared plus higher order term. So actually, this also I can just embed in this error term over here. OK? Very good. Now, you see, though, that this gives you something which you can control. I mean, you can take one dfk if you want, and then you can say, OK, but the modulus of dfk is bounded by the Lipschitz constant, which is epsilon k bar. So that's, that has to be equal to 0. Now I, can, now I have something linear. I can divide by the uh, constant, which would give me gk. So when I pass to the gk, I divide by a constant here. I divide by a constant here, but then this epsilon bar k squared remains, OK? So now you have 0 is equal to the integral of dgk d phi. And then here you have something like b go of dgk times epsilon bar k squared times C0 norm of d phi, OK? Now, this is uniformly under control because the Dirichlet energy of dgk is equal to 1. So if I just use Cauchy-Schwarz, I can bound by a constant, and then I have the integral of dgk squared to the 1 half. And the Dirichlet energy is equal to 1. So this is uniformly bounded. If you fix phi, epsilon bar k is going to 0, this whole junk 
is disappearing. This is going to zero. And of course now, GK is converging weakly in W12 to G, so this quantity converges to the derivative of G weakly, and, and phi is a fixed test function, right? So you let K go to, to infinity, and you discover zero is equal to the integral of DG times D phi for every test function which was C infinity compactly supported. And that's harmonic. Okay, so that's claim one. And you've seen how the expansion of the area functional leads you to the Dirichlet energy. Okay? So which was the realization of the, of the Georgi for proving this epsilon regularity theorem, okay? which he did in co-dimension one. Although his proof was not exactly going this way. Anyway, that was claim one. Now, how do you get claim two? So why actually in the hell should you converge uniformly to, um, um, why should you actually converge uh, uh, strongly in L2? Well, okay, it's tempted actually not to test with phi, but to test with phi times fk as well. So look at this identity. Of course, I can also perturb by phi times fk, because that is a compactly supported perturbation. So everything that you have written over here is going to work even if you put phi fk, right? So let us test with phi fk instead. The only important point on the test function is that you can make computations, and this is a Lipschitz perturbation, so it's fine. And that, of course, you need a perturbation which is compactly supported, and the compact support is going to give you, is given you by the fact that phi is compactly supported, right? So when you make this test function over here, you will actually discover that zero is equal, and then you will get integral of the fk d of phi fk, right? And then you will get O of d fk d of phi fk. And then epsilon k is cleared. Okay, now redivide once again by the constant, which is gives you gk. And you have but to divide by its squared, right? To get gk here and gk here, which is squared. But that gets absorbed by this guy and this guy as well. So you can actually write also this inequality, I mean this identity. And when you write this identity, you divide by here, you still get this epsilon k squared surviving. So this is actually giving you something which goes to zero. Huh? So plus vanishing as k goes to zero. Okay, so now you get some interesting thing. So expand this. So you get the integral of phi times dgk squared is equal to minus the integral of gk dgk phi times d phi plus vanishing. Okay? So let epsilon k go to zero. If you let epsilon k go to zero, what happens? So here's something interesting. This part is very nice because GK converging strongly in L2 and DGK converges weakly in L2. So this converges weakly to G DG D phi. So the limit of this integral, for which of course I cannot say I'm going to DG squared because I don't know strong convergence yet. I can say that this is equal to minus the limit of that integral, and the limit of that integral is g dg d phi. Ah, but now I know from claim one that g is harmonic. 
So I recognize over here the integral of minus g, so dg, d of g phi minus integral of dg squared phi. And now this vanishes because of harmonicity. Okay? So if this vanishes because of harmonicity, I've just discovered that when I integrate dgk squared modulus times phi, compactly supported test function, I'm always converging to phi modulus of dg squared, and that's strong L1 convergence of modulus of dgk to dg. I mean, strong L2, uh, strong L2, dg squared. And then, of course, this implies the strong L2 convergence of dgk. So, claim two. Good. So, now let us get to the contradiction. So, why in the hell should actually be that harmonic functions have this estimate? Well, if you're an harmonic function, what I'm just saying is that you actually have this. So if G is harmonic, what I'm just saying is that the integral of dG on the ball of radius 1 half minus dG computed at 0, right, squared dx is less or equal than 1 quarter integral of modulus of dG x on the ball of radius 1. And then here I had squared. But in fact, I'm telling you much more. This is going to be less or equal than this guy. And of course, this guy, you don't have to be harmonic to be less or equal than this one. OK? So how actually it comes that I have this inequality over here for harmonic functions. Well, of course, if I want to prove this inequality for harmonic functions, since when I subtract in a fine function, I'm still harmonic, I can actually simply assume that dg of 0 is equal to 0, right? So in other words, if h is harmonic, and dh of 0 is equal to 0, then I just have this inequality. But now, where do you actually see the derivative really playing a role? Nowhere. Because the derivative of an harmonic function is an harmonic function as well. So what I'm actually saying is that, in fact, you give me an harmonic function. Say, hey, uh, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm lacking uh, uh, um, letters now. Um, Z. And Z of 0 equals 0. Then I have this decay. And I can take a real valued harmonic function. Why is that? OK, I, I could tell you it's a simple exercise. In fact, it is, but let me give you at least a hint. So harmonic functions, as any decent function which is real analytic, you can write in a Taylor polynomial. OK, so write the Taylor polynomial at 0. So z of x is equal now to some of the Taylor polynomials, I mean, of the polynomials in the Taylor expansions. Let us call them pi of x. But observe, there is no zero polynomial because z of 0 is equal to 0. So the polynomial starts with order 1. Okay. Now, one of the funny things is that if this is harmonic, each of these polynomials, which are homogeneous of degree i, they have to be harmonic. And one of the interesting facts is that they are L2 orthogonal. So harmonic polynomials of different degrees, they are L2 orthogonal. So in fact, this integral is equal to the series over here. On all balls, 
on the ball of radius 1 half as, he, as on the ball of radius 1. Why? Because when you actually go into spherical coordinates, what you discover is that the traces of the polynomials, they are orthogonal on the sphere. And that's because the traces of the polynomials are the eigenvalues of the Laplacians on the sphere. And for different degrees, you get different eigenvalues. And when you have different eigenvalues for a self-adjoint operator, then you're just orthogonal in L2. Okay? So you have now this identity. for every R, but these are homogeneous functions of degree R to the, uh, of, of degree I. So actually this is equal to sum of constants, and the constants you have to compute by integrating this thing on the sphere times R to the M plus 2I. But you're starting from I equal 1. So for one half, you see the sum of one half to the power m plus 2i. And for one, you see uh, 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 the sum of ci. So actually, it seems I've proved a, a stronger, a stronger, okay, so this, I, I actually made a mistake along the way. So what I've actually proved is the following inequality. So it's one quarter plus two to the m. Huh? But actually, that was silly because, uh, uh, remember, in the excess, I have to average. So any time I actually wrote this integral over here, what I really meant was the average. Okay? So I always had to average, and the average is what it's, the average is what it's to the 2 to the m, and what is surviving is the fact that I'm starting this series with 1, which gives me, which gives me 1 quarter for 2 and 1 for r equal 1. Okay, so that's the proof of Allard. Now, why is all of this not working in higher co-dimension? Okay? Well, actually, this literal thing is working in higher co-dimension as well, right? We didn't, we didn't use the co-dimension everywhere. So any time that you're able to write your current as a graph, then you can actually apply the De Giorgi Allard theorem. Now, the point is that, of course, a priori, you don't know that you can write it as a graph. So the idea of De Giorgi and then of Allard was if you can approximate your current efficiently with the graph of Lipschitz functions, then you cannot apply exactly this machinery, but some perturbation of it. So the real question becomes, say that I give you an integral rectifiable area minimizing current, and say that the excess is small. Do you at least know that grosso modo, more or less, you're very close to a single Lipschitz function? Then if it were true, then you would be C1 alpha by alpha, the judge. So, this happens to be true in co-dimension one, always. So anytime that the excess is small, you're close to a graph. See, it's slightly tricky because your current comes with a multiplicity. So what does it mean that you're close to a graph? Well, it means you're close to a graph with a certain multiplicity. And the multiplicity is constant over the graph. Now, here there's a problem in higher co-dimension. fact, any holomorphic sub-variety of Cn is an area minimizing current. Okay, so how actually that can be possible? So how can you prove something like this easily? Well, let's go for the complex one-dimensional holomorphic sub-variety. 
So this, of course, is not going to be really a proof. I will give you everything by exercise, but at least I tell you what are the statements. So for sub varieties of co-dimension one, of, of dimension one, of complex dimension one, so in C2, it would be ZW such that H of ZW is equal to zero for some holomorphic function of two variables. Observe the following thing. So take the so-called Keller form. OK, so if you have complex coordinates Z1, Zn, given by the coordinates Zj is equal to Xj plus I, Yj. If you're given these complex coordinates, then the Keller form is simply the following form, omega. It's dx1 wedge dy1 plus dx2 wedge dy2 plus, plus dxn wedge dyn. Now, of course, this form is closed, right? The omega is equal to 0. That's pretty easy because it has constant coefficients on the standard basis. So that's obvious. What is not obvious is the following thing. So this is difficult, but it's not even that difficult. It's a computation. So if I'm computing omega, on two vectors, E1, E2. So this is equal to 1 if and only if E2 is equal to J, E1. What is J? J is the linear map, which is like the multiplication by I. So J is the linear map which sends x1, y1, x2, y2, x n y n into minus y1 x1 minus y2 x2 minus y n x n. It's like multiplication by i read in the real coordinates. And omega, okay, so uh, 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 maybe here I should say if modulus of e1 equal modulus of e2 is equal 1, then this omega of E1, E2 is equal 1, if and only if E2 is equal to J, E1. Okay? Which means that when you, when you are integrating your form over a surface, if the surface has a complex tangent space with the canonical orientation, then the integral, the integrand is equal to 1. Otherwise, it's strictly less than 1. Okay? So, with these two things, which, by the way, all together make this form omega a calibration with two things together, you actually get the following. So you give me your favorite complex one-dimensional sub-variety. Say sigma. And you orient this with the canonical orientation, which means every plane is a complex plane, so it's spanned by a basis, which is E, J, E. And you take first E in the basis and then J, E. Okay? So that's the canonical orientation. Then the area of sigma is equal to the integral of, over sigma of 1 which is equal to the integral over sigma of omega, because omega on the tangent plane is exactly equal to 1. Now, if you have some other surface gamma with the same boundary, right? you could actually say, aha, the integral over sigma of omega is actually equal to the integral over gamma of omega. Why so? 
because omega is, is, is closed, inner n closed means exact, so omega is actually the d of a form. It's actually not so difficult to find which d it is. It is actually the d of the following form, x1 dy1 plus x2 dy2 plus, plus xn dyn. And now I can apply Stokes' theorem and say, if this is nu, the integral over sigma of omega is equal to the integral over the boundary of sigma of nu, which is equal to the integral over the boundary of gamma of nu, which is equal to the integral over gamma of omega, right? But now omega is a number which is strictly less or equal than 1. Because omega of e1, e2 is equal 1 if and only if e2 is equal j1. Maybe I should have said over here. And otherwise, that's what that is if. Omega of e1, e2 is less or equal than 1. OK? Well, if this is less or equal than 1, then this is going to be less or equal than the area of gamma. And now you're done under the assumption that the boundary of gamma is equal to the boundary of sigma you actually have that the area of gamma is bigger or equal than the area of sigma, which is showed you that sigma is an area minimizing current. So a calibration is a form which does this trick. The omega is equal to 0. Omega on some simple planes is equal to 1. And on all the other simple planes is less or equal than 1. In such a way that when you have the correct tangent, you can replace the integral of 1 with the integral of omega, or in other words, omega uh, restricted on the surface is the volume form, and on any other surface which does not, have, does, not, does not have the correct tangent is actually less or equal than the volume form. Okay, so now we come to the end. After having learned this, we now can show you that what I stated at the beginning as the false, the Georgi theorem, is in fact false in higher co-dimension, meaning the excess can be extremely small, but nonetheless, it might happen that the point is singular, OK? So take the following sub-variety in C2. OK, of course, you are singular, meaning I cannot write my, my, my set as a single graph of a function. See, if I try to write my set as this graph, I'm running into troubles because I'm taking a square root in complex plane. So I have two determinations of the square root. But if I try to do the opposite, then I have the cube root, and then I have three determinations. OK? On the other hand, check the excess of your current on the ball of radius r centered at the origin is converging to 0. And why is that? It's because when you are in these coordinates, if you are on a determination of the square root, you have actually looking at the function to the three halves. When you differentiate the function to the three halves, you get still something which is very, very small. I mean, the, 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 the tangent plane is all, almost flat anyway. Okay? So formally, when you differentiate the, the w to the 3 half, you get w to the 1 half. And w to the 1 half is going to 0 as w goes to 0. OK? So what is the problem over here? The problem is that even if the excess is small, this does not guarantee you that you are actually well approximated by a Lipschitz function. Not at all. Because you can take a determination. You go back and, oops, I have to take another determination. So I need two valued functions, actually. OK, this is, on the other hand, the starting point of what Emanuele is going to do next week. So the starting point of the regularity theory in higher co-dimension is to try to replace harmonic single-valued functions for which we had uh, the Georgi Allard working with multiple-valued functions. So upshot of the regularity theory in higher co-dimension use multiple valued functions. Unfortunately, it's not as nice as, as Allard, because you can make a theory of multiple valued functions, which are harmonic, 
but they don't have this one quarter decay which I showed you. The decay is just false. So it's not like you can replace with multiple valued harmonic functions and try to prove Allard with them because that actually fails as well. In fact, the proof is so, so complicated, so it's that long, because essentially there is a series of things that you can hope, and they sort of dramatically fails all of them. I mean, you just have to go like through three or four very daring ideas, and the first phase, the second phase, the third phase, towards the fourth or fifth, actually, you have something which is finally working, which makes the whole thing very complicated. Okay, so um, this was a tour de force, I guess. But it's the end, at least from my part. <laughs>